This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Financial performance measurement. Uh, in the previous chapters, we looked at divisional performance. Uh, here, we're looking at various ratios, ultimately, uh, to help us consider the overall financial performance of a company, the company as a whole. Uh, primarily, of course, we want uh, our company to be more profitable, but just to look at absolute profits would be a bit meaningless. Um, if the company's had a, a lot more investment this year, we expect a lot more profit. And so, uh, as you'll see as we go through them, we'll look at it mainly in terms of various ratios. Um, ratios on their own don't mean very much. We do need some to compare with. And so, as you'll see in paragraph 1.1, um, standardly, we might compare this year with last year to the same company to see if we're improving or getting worse. Um, we may compare instead with similar companies, make sure we're doing at least as well. Uh, we may have various targets, fine, compare with targets. Or industry averages, if we know um, how the industry as a whole is doing, fine, compare our company with them. So uh, uh, very few of the ratios we're coming to mean much on their own. It's really a question of comparing. Are they better than last year? Are they worse than last year? And we need to look at three main areas. Profitability, obviously. We always want profitability to improve. Uh, liquidity. Have we enough cash to keep going? Too many companies end up closing down because they go bankrupt effectively rather than um, necessarily being loss-making. And gearing, looking at how the company is raising its long-term finance, how much from shareholders, how much from uh, long-term borrowing. Now, there's a whole series of ratios that you need to learn and you must learn, and they're all listed on the later pages. We'll check them with an example. And most of them are very straightforward indeed. The arithmetic shouldn't be a problem. But it's not simply for the exam being able to calculate a figure. It is important that you're aware of the significance uh, of the figure, what it means, whether we want it to be high or lower, and so on. Uh, for most of them, that's fairly obvious. But uh, let's just make sure. Let's check the calculations and the relevance by using exercise one. If you turn to pages two and three, you've got there a fairly uh, full statement of financial position for a company uh, in two years. This year, 20x7, last year, 20x6. And you can see it's very conventional, non-current assets, current assets, total assets, 3655, as against 2505. And then liabilities and capital. Uh, total shareholders funds, capital and reserves, 2190s against 1401. Uh, Long-term liabilities, non-current liabilities, 500s against 400. And current liabilities, payables, tax dividends, 965 is against 704. So the total, again, 3655, 2505. On the following page, income statements for both years. They show top down all the figures, but um, the final profit is the profit after tax, 478266. But we've also shown there how much of that profit went out as dividend and how much was retained as part of the retained earnings. Uh, we've then got all the ratios, they're all listed there, so I'm not going to write the formulae on the screen, you've got them in front of you. But let's hopefully not taking too long. Let's go through each of these ratios, uh, check you're happy uh, about the figures we're using and the relevance uh, of the figure we end up with. So let's work through, first of all, the profitability ratios. Uh, the first one, the net profit margin. Um, we'll do both, I'll put them side by side, this year, last year. 
the net profit margin um, is the profit for interest tax divided by as a percentage of the revenue. Uh, now, some people get a bit upset here because in other contexts, particularly in financial accounts, net profit tends to mean the very final profit, which here would be 478 in 20687. However, for reasons I will explain in a minute, um, in these ratios, more sensibly, net profit is the net operating profit the profit before charging interest and before charging tax. So checking from the income statement, in 20x7, well although the final profit was 478, the profit before tax was 740, but that was after finance costs interest charges, so the profit before interest and tax, the profit from operations, the operating profit is 790, as against last year at 462. Uh, again, on like its own, that means very little, then oh, it's gone up, good. But of course, you'd expect it to go up because sales have gone up. The profit margin is that divided by the revenue. 20x7 was 7180, previous year 5435. So as a percentage, 790, 7180. Is 11 percent uh, as against last year 462 5435 last year it was 8.5 percent so I've already uh, explained why it's more important to look at various ratios like this rather than the absolute figure uh, however I think it goes without saying we have improved on that measure this year so whatever we're selling we are selling at a higher make higher profitability. 11% is better than 8.5. Uh, we can look in slightly more detail though because obviously the net profit is the revenue less the cost of sales and less the expenses. So you know profit could have gone up because we've got a higher uh, gross profit margin you know we managed to cut the cost of sales, or it could be that we've managed to cut uh, admin expenses. And so the gross profit margin, I think speaks for itself, the gross profit, profit before expenses, 1795 as against last year 1223, again as a percent of the revenue. So in both cases, these are obviously going to be higher than the net profit margin. What are they? 25% in X7 last year. 22.5%. So again, things look good there. Uh, how do you found that, oh, how do you found perhaps the net profit, the gross profit margin have gone down slightly? Then the net profit margin going up would have meant we'd managed to cut our expenses a lot. But here they've both gone up. I don't think we can say much more. Uh, next, most important of all the measures is the return on capital employed. Um, Return on capital employed, which is, uh, again, I did say I would explain why, and I will shortly, but we take the profit before interest and tax, which we calculated earlier, the operating profit, which is 790,462. Uh, and again, although we've made higher profits, if there is more investment in the business, then of course you'd be ex hoping, expecting it to generate more profit. So a percentage of the total capital in the business, which you can get two ways, very much depends on how much information is given to you, but it's the total long-term finance. So if you look at the um, statements of financial position, in 20x7, the finance, the capital, 2190 was coming from shareholders, the share capital plus the retained profit, 
In addition, 500 from a long-term loan, so a total of 2690. Whereas last year, shareholders' funds were 1401, um, long-term loans 400. So before I say any more, let's just have to get the percentages. 790 divided by 2690, this year is 29.4%. Whereas last year, it was 25.6%. Or 257 I'm sorry. So that has improved. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But before I do, uh, firstly, we took the profit before interest and tax. And the reason for that is that, uh, well, tax is really outside the control of our managers. We want to see how well is the company being run. And just because the state might put the tax rate up or down, um, hardly means that the company is being run any better or any worse, so it's before tax. Um, and secondly, it's before interest, because we want to see the total return the company is making on the capital that's raised. The capital includes the um, long-term loans, and so it would be wrong to look at the, the profit after interest. Uh, the other thing I said was that um, the capital employed in net two ways. Most obviously, for this question, it's shareholders' funds plus uh, long-term loans. But do be clear, that's always going to be equal to uh, total assets minus current liabilities. And so if you just check for, for X7, on our example, uh, total assets, non-current plus current, are 3655. Current liabilities are 965. Um, and if you take the difference, 3655 minus 965, again, is 2690. Doesn't matter which way you get it, but um, you know, just depends what information you're given. We wouldn't necessarily be given a complete step to financial position. Anyway, um, that's return on capital employed, and I, I think clearly the higher that is, the better, so that has improved, we'd be happy about it. But there are actually two ways of improving the return on capital. Um, either you can sell what you sell at a higher Profit margin, if we're making more profit percentage-wise on everything we sell, I think inevitably that's going to increase the return on capital employed. But the other way of doing it is to use your capital more efficiently. If we sell more for the same level of capital, then we're going to end up making more profit, a better return on capital employed. Now, let me show you what I mean. We already know we are selling everything at a higher margin. That's good. That on its own would help improve the return on capital. But the other thing we can look at is the next one, the asset turnover. Which looks to see, are we selling more for the amount of capital or less? You can see it's the revenue uh, let me write my years down again because I'm going forward. It's the revenue which this year was 7180, last year 5435, divided by the long term capital. Well, I've already said enough about that a minute ago. Uh, this year is 2690, last year was 1801. Now, this we tend to write just as a number, not as a percent. So the asset turnover, 7180 divided by 2690, is 2.67. What does that mean? It means that we are managing to make sales 2.67 times the level of capital. What was it last year? 
5435 divided by 1801 last year was 3.02. Now think about that for a minute. You see, all right, our sales have increased on its own. That's good, obviously. Sales go up. But we'd expect them to go up because the company is substantially bigger with a lot more capital. And what's happened last year, our sales were three times the capital. To be doing the same this year, I still want sales to be three times the capital. In fact, they're only 2.67 times the capital. And so this one does appear to be perhaps not so good, that we're not generating as much per dollar of capital as we were last year. And now I did say that, um, although it's mentioned on a much later page, I may as well mention it now. I said return on capital employed was the single most important overall profit measure. But I also said the way we increase it is either by getting a higher gross profit, a higher profit margin than everything we sell, or by selling more for the amount of capital. And so although it is mentioned on a later page, um, something called the DuPont relationship, that the return on capital employed is equal to um, the net profit margin times the asset turnover. So if I just look at um, the two years, in 20x6, asset turnover was 3.02. Uh, the net profit margin was 8.5%. And so the return on capital employed um, is 25.7. Yes. Which agrees with what we calculated. Of course, it does actually, if you look at the formulae. Uh, in 2000XD7, the asset turnover fell a little bit, which wasn't in itself good, but the net profit margin increased, and that was good. The two together give us the return on capital employed, which is 29.4%. Is that what we've got? Yes, it is. So that's the point I was trying to make. Um, and of course, although we want return on capital employed to go up, what we'll always be wanting is to increase both the net profit margin and the asset turnover to the extent we can increase both, uh, so much the better. Uh, anyway, back to the um, various ratios. Uh, those are the profitability ratios you need. Uh, next, the liquidity ratios. Well, we're looking at the short term, how well have they been managing the short term money. Um, and probably the most important is the current ratio. Sorry, we're on the next page. 20x7, 20x6. The current ratio is the current assets, which if you look back at the centre financial position, are, I can't find them, 2314 this year, last year 1679 divided by the current liabilities this year 965 last year 704 and again uh, this we don't write generally as a percentage just as a number so 2314 divided by 965 is 2.40 whereas last year Uh, 2.39. So it's changed marginally, but it's um, minimum. Uh, the relevance of that, um, firstly, it's one of the few ratios that actually means anything on its own. You know, all the others so far, they've only meant anything by comparing. 
But um, surely if a company is going to keep going in the short term, we do need the current assets to be more than the current liabilities. We do need it to be more than one. And so if ever the current ratio was less than one, or in fact was approaching one, you'd be very scared indeed. Uh, because it would mean that in the short term they couldn't pay the bills. Uh, I say even if it's approaching one, um, you know, if we're below one, we've got a huge problem. But even if they're above one, if year by, if year, by year they're going down, you know, and it's getting closer to one, then we'd start to be worried. So that is one that we can look on its own. Here, obviously, we seem to be way above one. Uh, but there's no magic figure. Different types of business will have different levels of um, current assets, current liabilities. For instance, a manufacturing company will have inventories. A service company won't have inventories. Um, so there is no sort of perfect level for the current ratio. If it gets too high, uh, Van itself can be worried. You know, you don't want to keep huge levels of inventory. It might take too long to sell them, you know. Risk of them um, becoming obsolete. So this is one where, all right, there's no major movement to worry about either way. But uh, one certainly where perhaps comparing with similar companies would make more sense. And then we'd know whether that was a reasonable level or not. Um, I did say if that went below uh, one or got close to one, we'd be worried we couldn't pay bills. We can take one bit further, though, because current assets here, inventory, receivables, cash. Well, our current liabilities, cash is immediately available, obviously. Receivables, well, it will take time for us to collect in the money. But payables, it will take time before we... Pay out the money, so we can afford to wait a bit. The fact that receivables isn't immediately available because payables aren't immediately payable. Inventory is a slightly bigger problem though, because in order to get the cash from inventory, first of all we have to sell the goods, which could take us a while, and then of course we've got to wait until we get the money in. So it does take that that bit longer to collect the money, and so the next one is the quick ratio, also called the acid test ratio, which is exactly the same as um, the current ratio, same logic, except we exclude the inventory on the basis in the very short term that cash won't be there. So if we remove the inventory, uh, the current assets otherwise this year are uh, What? Something gone wrong, I calculate. Sorry, 2314 minus the inventory. A 1308. Last year it was 808. The current liability is 965704. Uh, and so again, um, as a ratio, not as a percent. Now, obviously, this would always be lower than the current ratio. This year it's 136. Last year, 1.15. Uh, so it's always going to be lower. Uh, and so, all right, that's going to be, oh, well, I'm not surprised it's a lot closer to 1. If it goes below 1, uh, then I, again, I will start to be worried. Otherwise, to be honest, there's not a lot we can say because a reasonable level depends on the type of business. It's all right, it's gone up, but I can't necessarily say that's good, that's bad. I've been much more interested in what similar companies, what the industry as a whole, uh, what sort of ratio they have. Uh, next, well, I mentioned... Um, you know, we don't have to carry too much inventory and things that might go obsolete. Well, you'll see there are three measures here looking at um, individual items of the um, net current assets. Now, the first one is inventory days. Uh, 
And you'll see inventory over cost of sales, um, because the level of inventory has gone up, 1,006 this year, 871 last year. But that all doesn't mean too much. What would be interesting to know is how many days will my inventory last for? How many days of inventory I'm actually holding? So you can see there, if we divide by the cost of sales, from the um, income statement, the cost of sales this year is 5385. So it would appear that, you know, we need 5,000 for the year. We've got 1,000 in inventory, which is about a fifth of a year. Or if we assume 365 days in a year, which you would unless told otherwise, we've got enough inventory to last us. I think it's 68 days, two months, which does seem rather a long time. There's a lot of inventory to hold. Again, does depend uh, a lot on the type of business. You, most businesses clearly will want to hold some inventory, but um, 68 days, two months, seems an awful lot. Uh, last year, inventory was lower, but so were cost of sales at 4212. And so last year, ooh, 75 days, which strikes me as even worse. Again, I don't know what it is they're producing. There could be a good reason for it, but 75 days seems an awful long time. The fact we've managed to reduce it, I would have thought, is probably a good thing. I've already said, if you hold too much inventory, the danger is you might never sell it. Goes out of date, all sorts of things. Although, again, I would like to know what the industry average was. Uh, one other thing while we're here, but it's quite a general point, it's made in the notes at the end, is there's always a danger with any ratio, especially with this one, of things being a bit distorted, in that we're using the sales, the cost of sales for the year. Uh, we've taken the inventory at the end of the year. Now, that's normally the case. That's normally all we can do. But you see, if our sales have been going up a lot during the year, at the beginning of the year, they were at the rate of 4,000 a year. By the end of the year, they were at the rate of 6,000 a year. Then they, you'd expect the end of the year inventory to be a lot higher. And it can distort it. So uh, there's always that danger that we are using end of year figures. And again, figures at the end of the year could be happen to be unusually high or unusually low, which again would distort it. Now, before I leave that, some people say, oh, well, wouldn't it be better to look at average inventory? Or perhaps it would. But we don't have enough information here. For, two zero, for this year, 2007, we could work out the average. At the end of last year, beginning of this year, it was 871. At the end of this year, it's 1006. So we could average them. But the trouble is, we couldn't do that for 2066 because we only know the inventory at the end of the year. Uh, so you've got to compare line with line. Using average would be better, but um, it would be unusual to have enough information. Anyway. Let's get these out of the way. Where are you up to? Next one. Uh, the collection period or the receivables days. Uh, here, we're simply trying to measure how long is it taking us to collect in our receivables. So we take the receivables at the end of the year, which for X7 we're 9.48. Um, divide by the revenue for the year, and again, with 365 days in a year, uh, there we are. So 948, 7180, it would appear to be taking us this year approximately 48 days 
to collecting our receivables. Whereas what was it last year? Uh, receivables were 708, sales 5435, Uh, 40, 7.5 days. So this has hardly changed. So no real comment on that side. Uh, 48 days, what's that? One and a half months. Um, I can't really make too much comment. Now again, it's very much uh, on the type of business. Um, if our competitors are all giving two months credit, we're doing quite well getting the money in in 48 days. However, if our competitors are collecting money in 30 days, then obviously we're not doing so well. So it, it does matter the type of business. Um, certainly if it was going up, uh, I might start to be a bit worried, but uh, things haven't really changed. The other one, payables days, exactly the same idea, except here, how long are we taking to pay our payables, our creditors? Trade payables this year 653. Um, we should strictly use credit purchases because that's what we owe the money on. And if you're given purchases uh, in the in the question, you would use it. Here we we're, we're not. So all we can use, to be honest, is cost of sales, which is 5385. So it's not very satisfactory, but certainly in the exam, you would use cost of sales if you didn't have the information for purchases. But on that basis, it's 44 days, whereas last year, payables 516, Cost of sales score two one two. Uh, forty four point seven days, forty five days. So again, the change here is minimal. It's neither here nor there. Um, again, I'd want to know industry average. It's, it doesn't appear, you know, if this was too big or too small sort of thing, very big or very small, I might be concerned. Uh, careful of one, well, yes, two things really. Uh, firstly, it's tempting to say the higher that is, the better. You know, we want to delay paying our creditors. We don't want to, want to pay them too fast. Which is true, except if we let that figure get too high, if we were taking three months to pay our suppliers, then the danger is, of course, suppliers stop supplying, and if suppliers don't supply, then we've got huge problems. So uh, I think it's logical why we don't want to pay too quickly, but at the same time, we wouldn't want to delay too long. Also, it's interesting to compare those two. Yeah, there's not much difference. We're collecting uh, from our customers in 48 days, we're paying our supplier in 44 days, slightly faster. But if there was a big difference, you know, if, you, if you're paying your suppliers in 10 days, but you're taking 30 days to collect from your customers, then that would be a bit silly. You, you'd want to try you know, and equalise those. I have said already, but I'll say again, ideally, we'd have used purchases there and not cost of sales. So this could be very distorted. Um, but here we've no choice. You know, in the exam, it's see what information you are given. Right, so that's liquidity. Finally, gearing. Let's look at the measures and then discuss the relevance. Um, two measures to be aware of. One is the gearing ratio itself. Uh, 
And this is now the long term liabilities. Uh, this year 500, last year 400. Uh, as a percentage of the amount raised from shareholders, the shareholders firms, this year 2190, last year 1401. Now different people measure this in slightly different ways, but this is the way that you should measure it for this exam. It comes to 500, 2190, 22.8% this year, and last year 400 divided by 1401. 28.6%. Now what's that telling us? Obviously our total finance we've raised has gone up this year. We've raised more money. Some of the money we've raised has come from shareholders. Some of the money we've raised has come from uh, loans. But it's giving us a measure of the proportion. Uh, here, last year, a greater proportion of our money came from loans, long-term loans. This year, we say we've lower gearing. There's a lower proportion that's come up from loans. All right? Now, why do we care? You know, is that good, is that bad? Well, gearing, there's no, we can't really say it's good, it's bad. There are advantages and disadvantages. Advantages of higher gearing. Uh, which higher gearing means we've got more long-term borrowing. Well, without writing a long essay here, because it's not relevant here, the main thing is that wherever we borrow money, there's a cost attached. You know, with shareholders, they'll expect dividends, and the more money from shareholders, the more dividends will pay. On the other hand, loans, of course, will have to pay interest. But the beauty or the advantage of borrowing from loans is that any interest you pay uh, gets tax relief. It's allowable for tax. The more interest, the less tax the business will pay. So it makes it cheaper. It's cheaper borrowing because of tax relief. Whereas, of course, uh, pay out dividends to the shareholders. There's no tax saving. Now, there's a lot more I can say, but it would be going over the top for this bit. However, the main disadvantage of higher gearing is there's more risk for the shareholders. And I say more risk in two ways. More, most obvious, but least important, is of course if the company ever collapsed, the debt lenders, the long-term borrowing, gets paid out first. The shareholders only get anything that's left. So the more borrowing there's been, the less likely there is to have money left from shareholders. And more importantly, even forgetting the company collapsing, Before shareholders can get a dividend, interest has to be paid first. And so, they're at bigger risk. If profits do fall, they've still got to pay the full amount of any interest. There's more risk to shareholders of there being nothing left for the dividend. So both ways around, it makes things more risky. Uh, and of course, if shareholders own it, uh, so that's why shareholders might not like it. Now, uh, I've said twice, there's a lot more we could say, but just not relevant here. But that's why we stand to be interested. But there is no, unless it's really extreme, uh, there is no, we can't say 
that 22% is any better or worse than 28%, quite frankly. The other measure, which relates to something I said a minute ago, is the interest cover. So the last measure of all, but still related to the gearing. Uh, the profit before interest and tax, which we had earlier, where is it? 790 this year, 462 last year, divided by um, the interest charge. And again, I said earlier, finance costs is the interest. So 50, 52. Uh, this is a number, not a percent. So this year is 15.8. Last year, 8.9. Uh, and what this is showing is how easy is it for the business to pay the interest. You know, obviously they can afford to pay the interest, but next year profits may be a bit lower. Are we still going to be able to afford the interest? Because if we can't afford the interest, obviously the risk of the company is shutting down. Now here, absolutely no problem, good heavens. The profit's 15.8 times the interest. And so profit would have to fall enormously before we couldn't pay out the interest. But if you see, if you did have something like this, if the interest cover, if the profit was 52 and the interest was 50, if it was something like 1.04, I'd be very, very scared because it would only need profits to fall by a tiny bit next year. And then, of course, if we can't pay the interest, we've got huge problems. Uh, the levels we've got here, well, again, <laughs> absolutely no problem. Um, I have no worries at all. It's only when that got very small that you might start to become, well, you would start to become scared. Okay, there are all the ratios on the final couple of pages. Uh, paragraph three says the DuPont relationship. I've already mentioned that. It's a return on capital employed. is. Um, uh, the net profit margin times the asset turnover. Uh, there's also mention of benchmarking, which connects to this because I have said that most of these ratios are only relevant when we're comparing is it better or worse than last year and so on. Well, benchmarking is when you're measuring your performance against just their best in class companies or other standards of excellence. Um, so to have something to compare with, and you see there are four different types, and it's just learning the words. Competitive benchmarking, compare with competitors. How well are we doing compared with them? But as it says, it may be difficult to obtain that. Internal benchmarking, how we compare one bit of our business with another bit of our business. Functional benchmarking. Um, Instead of comparing the whole company with another company, compare one area, one function of our organisation with the same function of another organisation who's doing well. Or product benchmarking. Uh, again, comparing with a competitor, but um, comparing our product with their product. Finally, over the page, limitations of ratio analysis. Um, I've already been through these, mentioned these as we've been going through it, so I'm not going to speak anymore. Read that last page yourself as to why we've always got to be careful when we're using these ratios. The fact that they may be distorted, that sort of thing. So they're a basis for perhaps having investigation. But it's very dangerous to automatically say, oh, this is good or this is bad.